rivalry between the USSR and the USA that played out globally. We've tried to shy away from calling conflicts ideological or civilizational here on Crash Course, but in this case, the clash of civilizations model really does apply. Socialism, at least as Marx constructed it, wanted to take over the world, and many Soviets saw themselves in a conflict with bourgeois capitalism itself. And the Soviets saw American rebuilding efforts in Europe and Japan as the US trying to expand its markets, which, by the way, is exactly what we were doing. So the US feared that the USSR wanted to destroy democratic and capitalist institutions, and the Soviets feared that the US wanted to use its money and power to dominate Europe and eventually destroy the Soviet system. And both parties were right to be worried. It's not paranoia if they really are out to get you. Now, of course, we've seen a lot of geopolitical struggles between major world powers here on Crash Course, but this time there was the special added bonus that war could lead to the destruction of the human species. That was new for world history, and it's worth remembering it's still new. Here's the period of time we've discussed on Crash Course, and this is how long we've had the technological capability to exterminate ourselves. So that's worrisome. Immediately after World War II, the Soviets created a sphere of influence in Eastern Europe, dominating the countries where the Red Army had pushed back the Nazis. Which is why Winston Churchill famously said in 1946 that an Iron Curtain had descended across Europe. While the dates of the Cold War are usually given between 1945 and 1990, a number of historians will tell you that it actually started during World War II. Stalin's distrust of the US and Britain kept growing as they refused to invade Europe and open up a second front against the Nazis. And some even say that the decision to drop the first atomic bombs on Japan was motivated in part by a desire to intimidate the Soviets. That sort of worked, but only insofar as it motivated the Soviets to develop atomic bombs of their own, they successfully tested their first one in 1949. From the beginning, the US had the advantage because it had more money and power and could provide Europe protection, what with its army and one-of-a-kind nuclear arsenal, while Europe rebuilt. The USSR had to rebuild itself, and also they had the significant disadvantage of being controlled by noted asshat Joseph Stalin. I will remind right, you. Let's go to the thought bubble. Europe was the first battleground of the Cold War, especially Germany, which was divided into two parts, with the former capital, Berlin, also divided into two parts. And yes, I know the western part was divided into smaller occupation zones, but I'm simplifying. In 1948, the Soviets tried to cut off West Berlin by closing the main road that led into the city, but the Berlin airlift stopped them. And then in 1961, the Soviets tried again, and this time they were much more successful, building a wall around West Berlin, although it's worth noting that the thing was up for less than 30 years. I mean, Meatloaf's career has lasted longer than the Berlin Wall did. The US response to the Soviets was a policy called containment. It basically involved stopping the spread of communism by standing up to the Soviets wherever they seemed to want to expand. In Europe, this meant spending a lot of money. First, the Marshall Plan spent $13 billion on rebuilding Western Europe with grants and credits that Europeans would spend on American consumer goods and on construction. Capitalism's cheap food and plentiful stuff, it was hoped, would stop the spread of communism. The US also tried to slow the spread of communism by founding NATO and with CIA interventions in elections where communists had a chance, as in Italy. But despite all the great spy novels and shaken, not stirred martinis, the Cold War never did heat up in Europe. Probably the most important part of the Cold War that people just don't remember these days is the nuclear arms race. Both sides developed nuclear arsenals, the Soviets initially with the help of spies who stole American secrets. Eventually, the nuclear arsenals were so big that the US and USSR agreed on a strategy appropriately called MAD, which stood for Mutually Assured Destruction. Thanks, Thought Bubble. And yes, nuclear weapons were and are capable of destroying humanity many times over. But only once or twice did we get close close to nuclear war during the 1962 Cuban Missile Crisis, and then again in 1983 when we forgot to give the Russians the heads up that we were doing some war games which made it look like we had launched a first strike. Our bad! But even though mutually assured destruction prevented direct conflict, there was plenty of hot war in the Cold War. The Korean War saw lots of fighting between communists and capitalists, as did the Vietnam War. I mean, these days we remember the domino effect as silly paranoia, but after Korea and especially China became communist, Vietnam's movement toward communism seemed very much a threat to Japan, which the US had helped remake into a vibrant capitalist ally. So the US got bogged down in one of its longest wars while the Soviets assisted the North Vietnamese army in the Viet Cong, but then we paid them back by supporting the anti-communist Mujahideen after the Soviets invaded Afghanistan in 1979. Of course, as we now know, nobody conquers Afghanistan, unless you are the Mongols. 
So after 10 disastrous years, the Soviets finally abandoned Afghanistan. Some of those Mujahideen later became members of the Taliban, though, so it's difficult to say that anyone won that war. But it wasn't just Asia. In Nicaragua, the U.S. supported rebels to overthrow the leftist government. In El Salvador, the U.S. bolstered authoritarian regimes that were threatened by left-wing guerrillas. The United States ended up supporting a lot of awful governments, like the one in Guatemala, which held on to power through the use of death squads. Frankly, all our attempts to stabilize governments in Latin America led to some very unstable Latin American governments and quite a lot of violence. And then there were the lukewarm conflicts, like the Suez Canal crisis, where British and French paratroopers were sent in to try to stop Egypt from nationalizing the Suez Canal, or all the American covert operations to keep various countries from falling to communism. These included the famous CIA-engineered coup to overthrow Iran's democratically elected Prime Minister Mohammad Mossadi after his government attempted to nationalize Iran's oil industry, and the CIA helping Chile's General Augusto Pinochet overthrow democratically elected Marxist President Salvador Allende in 1973. And lest we think the Americans were the only bad guys in this, the Soviets used force to crush popular uprisings in Hungary in 1956 and in Czechoslovakia in 1968. So you may have noticed that our discussion of the Cold War has branched out from Europe to include Asia and the Middle East and Latin America, and in fact almost every part of the globe was involved in some way, with the planet being divided into three worlds. The first world was the U.S., Western Europe, and any place that embraced capitalism and a more or less democratic form of government. The second world was the Soviet Union and its satellites, mostly the Warsaw Pact nations China and Cuba. The third world was everyone else, and we don't use this term anymore because it lumps together a hugely diverse range of countries. We'll talk more about the specific economic and development challenges faced by the so-called third world countries, but the big one in terms of the Cold War was that neither the U.S. nor the Soviets wanted any of these countries to remain neutral. Every but just 20 years later, it's hard to believe that the world was once dominated by two superpowers held in check by mutually assured destruction. What's really amazing to me, though, is that until the late 1980s, it felt like the Cold War was going to go on forever. Time seems to slow as it approaches us, and living in the post-Cold War nuclear age, we should remember that the past feels distant even when it's near, and that the future seems assured even though it isn't. Thanks for watching. Ad Arna Westad's The Global Cold War. How did the Cold War shape the world we live in today? Ad Arna Westad, a leading historian of the Cold War era, wrote his book The Global Cold War to understand that question. Conventional accounts of the Cold War focused on Europe, but Westad thought it was more important to take a more global perspective. His analysis convinced him that what happened in the developing world had a far greater influence on why the Cold War ended with the collapse of one of the world's two superpowers, the Soviet Union, and why the world that emerged was primed for conflict. Westad argued that the main stage of the Cold War had actually lain outside Europe. Regional tensions and conflict in the developing world, he thought, had driven the USA and the USSR to intervene in them. But why? Let's scale things down. Both superpowers, American and Russian, needed the support of developing countries as well as Europe to advance their chances of winning the Cold War. The advisor war in the same insular fashion, discounting the importance the developing world had in shaping the conflict. But Westad's book expanded our focus beyond Europe to demonstrate how the real play for influence in developing countries captured support and bolstered each superpower during the International Cold War. Okay, so you viewed part of Crash Course uh, looking at a basic explanation of the Cold War. You've also looked at a quick synopsis of the Audarn Wested article. Um, what I would like to do is to just wrap this up with a quick discussion uh, incorporating Audarn Wested into really, you know, thinking about the Cold War in a different perspective. All right, so in there, he kind of discusses Adarn Wested, uh, the Global North. The Global North can really be discerned in this case, um, I would say, United States of America and the USSR and either the satellite or people in the NATO alliance. Well, you also have the Global South. The Global South right, is non-aligned states or people who were having their own revolutions and looking into, you know, per se, starting their own government, but that may have dictated something different from the Global North. So looking at this map, I would really say the Global North, you know, north of the equator or this section versus the Global South. 
which is down south of the equator and on over on um, the article um, it allowed other areas of the world to have agency within their actions um, really it allowed people to you know create revolutions or movements and then have other parts of the world vie for their interest taken point uh vietnam right there's a movement in vietnam right to either a we want to become our own power out of french right or b right we want to be under western influence or we want to be under communist influence well that played out um, through the 60s into the early 70s. Uh, Audarn Wested would argue that because of the war in Vietnam, it dictated reactions from the superpowers of the Cold War, the Soviet Union and the United States. Another action uh, well before this one would have been in the 50s, right, in Guatemala. Guatemala went through, you know, they call it what, the seven years of fall. And in there, they had a nationalistic movement, which really was trying to take out, um, they called it El Pupo, or it was the Guatemalan Fruit Company, which was owned by interest in the United States. And they tried to nationalize this. Well, the United States was not going to allow this kind of private enterprise, so they created kind of a smear campaign uh, in the public in the United States to allow that to seem like it was becoming communist and therefore we or i'm sorry the united states of america intervened um, this played out throughout the globe um, what is interesting about this Audarn west art is it gives a lot of agency to the global south it gives agency to the non-aligned movement or it even gives agency to those nation states or regions which were going through their own movements post world war ii um, I hope this has been interesting and I look forward to further discussions.